What is up, my friends? Um, I'm attempting a live stream tonight, but the problem is my computer is really not cooperating. Not my computer, my internet, I should say. And so if it's crazy buffering and not working, please let me know in the comments and we will try again another time. But for now, I'm going to attempt it. I hope that it works because I want to talk to you tonight about fill light and fill flash and using a beauty dish. So hope everyone's doing well. If you're joining me, thank you. Good to see you. And um, I just want to discuss something that I've been thinking about for a while now that I feel is important that we all need to understand. And that is fill light. Now, when I got started in studio photography, I remember as um, someone learning, asking a lot of my studio photographer friends, like, how do you get that depth in your photos? Like, I would look at my photos and they'd be like, everything looks flat, but in your photos, everything has this sort of 3D look. And so I had a lot of conversations with people about the size and the shape of the modifier and how you feather it and all of this, and all of this is important. Um, but it took me a long time to really learn about one of the other very important parts of this, which is fill. So I think pretty much every photographer, as they learn about studio photography, goes through these sort of stages. And I know at least I did. So let me t show you this image I took. And I took this image of me before, just before I started this tutorial. Um, and... So this is an image of me taken with a bare beauty dish. And I'll talk, talk to you a little bit about the beauty dish itself, but my main goal in this, in this live stream is to talk to you about fill flash and, or about fill in general. So let's talk about terminology first. So we have key light and fill light are two of the basic things we use in the studio. And key light refers to the main light you use. That's the main light that lights the subject. Fill light can be a number of different kinds of things, but it's anything that fills in the shadow areas. So now if you look at this image of me with just one light, you can see that it is a great handsome image of a really handsome guy, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but you can see that the shadows, because I used one light, are very, very dramatic and deep. And so let me explain the beauty dish first and then I'll go on to talk more about fill. So the beauty dish is one of my favorite modifiers to use. I love using it on myself actually when I do self portraits because for some reason I think it just works well with me. Um, but the thing you have to understand about a beauty dish is that you're going to get um, because of the way you place it. So but what you do with a beauty dish is you put it kind of above the person's head and you point it at them. Now, if you've ever seen a beauty dish, it has a center reflector, which is a small reflector in the center, and then the exposed dish around that. So you're supposed to really point that center reflector at the person's face. And I love using my beauty dish bare. So what that means is there's nothing covering the dish, just the, the, the reflector in the middle. And there's a thing called a sock that you put over a beauty dish, which I just don't like the terminology. It sounds weird and creepy to me, but basically a sock is just like a diffusion material that you can put over the beauty dish. I rarely use this when I use my beauty dish because I find it to be either, well, I find it to be just too flat. So what happens is when you put the sock on the beauty dish, I feel like a lot of times it starts to look like other modifiers and it doesn't have that drama and that sort of punch that you get from a beauty dish. So this image again is a picture of me, obviously, taken like an hour ago with a bare beauty dish. And if you look at the top here, you could see a little bit of the dish in the frame. Now, the problem with this image, not necessarily a problem, but the thing that maybe we don't want that we, we're going to address in this video is that if you look at the shadow areas, namely, can I zoom in? Is it gonna work? Let's see, there we go. Under my eyes, in my eye sockets, under my nose and under my chin, it's really dark. It's a really stark and dramatic shadow. Now, this is fine and this is kind of the look you get from a beauty dish, so you should expect this, but what you want to be able to do as a studio photographer, and I think what separates sort of the experienced from the inexperienced, is that the more experience you get 
as a studio photographer, the more you learn that really the fill light is where it's at. Because when I first started, as I said, like I was just happy to get something with depth, right? Because at first everything looked flat, everything looked crappy that I would take. And when one of my friends told me, no, you gotta point the modifier like this, use it here and do that. Then I was getting these really depth dramatic images, which were cool and great for me at the time in my growth. But the problem with them was that they were really too dramatic a lot of times. Not, not really too dramatic maybe, but the problem was that it was only dramatic. I didn't have any control over the shadow areas. So when we're talking about fill light, when we're understanding fill light, we're talking about controlling the amount of fill that goes in these shadows, shadow areas because we don't necessarily want all of this drama. Now, what I did is I set up the beauty dish in my studio. And again, it was a bare beauty dish pointing at me with no modifier on it, just the center reflector inside of the dish and that center small reflector sort of pointed right at my face. The next thing I did is I added a large umbrella just right behind the camera pointed straight at me. And it was like a six foot maybe umbrella. Um, as my first amount of fill. So what happens is, is when you add fill, what you're doing is you're gonna tone down those shadows. Cause as I already said, this is cool. I like this. I think this is a cool image of me. I, I really do like it, but not all the time you're gonna want this kind of drama in your image. A lot of times you're gonna want something that's less dramatic, okay? Depending on your client, depending on what you're doing. Now, even if you look at the live stream video, like I just stuck a flex panel in front of me and you can see that like it's really goes from, here's my face that's exposed and it's like super dramatic behind me because there's no fill, I just have a key light. Sometimes we don't want this. For the live stream, I was just happy to get this to work because I, I'm not really good at this yet, but I'm working on it, so don't worry about that. Okay, so, um, to recap, here is my bare beauty dish with no fill. Now, what I did next is I added a large umbrella right behind the camera, pointed sort of straight at me, sort of at about 20%, 25%. And look at the difference when I add that. So this is with one fill light. Now, check out those shadow areas. You're gonna see that right away when I added that fill light, I really, really toned down the drama in the shadows. It's still dramatic, it's still quite dramatic, I think. Uh, but if you look under my eyes, if you look under my nose, if you look at my neck, under my chin, you can see that adding that fill light really took away a lot of that drama. Um, and that's the point of a fill light. So here, we can see very clearly that adding the fill tones down those shadows. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because depending on who you're photographing, what the goal of the shoot is, what the person looks like, what the kind of photo is they want, all of these things are gonna come into play. Um, and so you can see here we have zero fill versus one large modifier. Now. This is still pretty dramatic, right? If you look at this second image. And so what I did was I added a second fill light to this image. Now, let me just digress for a second because I want to talk about how I really started to understand like, oh, it's the subtlety of the fill that's everything in photography. Like the subtle fill is what separates the people who know, really know studio photography from those just learning. And I started to learn that when I started to study the work of one of my heroes, Felix Kuhns. And um, I have Felix's um, lighting series, which is amazing. I highly recommend you go get it too. But what I started to notice as I studied Felix's work is that, you know, he didn't, he has the key light, which is obvious, right? You know, there's a key light but the fill is just as important. And if you watch his tutorials, a lot of times he will call the fill light the base layer. And he'll start even with the fill because it's so important and then show you how, well, you add your key on top of this. And so that is something that's really important for us as studio photographers to understand. So one of the cool things I learned from Felix, 
And what I'm able to do in my studio, because my studio basically has um, about, I would say they're about a little more than 10 feet tall sheetrock ceilings, is sometimes Felix will take a bare flash, put it really high at the ceiling, and just bounce it back into the subject. So now you're going to see in the next image I'm going to add to my little mix here is this third image now has the fill light, the large umbrella fill that I used here, but now it has another flash pointed at the ceiling and bouncing down more fill light. And now you could see, if I show you just these two images, so I'm going to get rid of, this was a bare beauty dish with zero fill. This is one fill umbrella. And now this next one, so this is the umbrella, and this next one has the umbrella plus another ba um, bare flash, really high point at the ceiling and bouncing back. So, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one of my favorite phrases that Pal to Tech says, one of my favorite YouTubers, take a look at this, would you take a look at that? So you can see now, this is one fill, this is with the second fill, and it's definitely more subtle. Now for every image here, I kept my camera settings the same. I used my Fuji X-T4 with 60-55-28 lens. I love that camera. It was set at ISO 80, 1 2 50th, F8, 41.4 millimeters, all of the photos for this. And you can see now that here's that one fill, and now here's the two fills with the the large umbrella plus a bare flash just bouncing off the ceiling. I'm gonna show you an example of this that I did um, with a client soon with a, with a trio that I photographed because I really was happy with the way this turned out and I want you to see kind of the difference it'll make. But just looking at my own mug here for a few more seconds, you can see that it's a little bit more subtle, right? There's a little bit less drama in those shadows. So as you add fill, you're making the shadows more subtle and you're allowing the skin tone to come through a little bit more. Now, um, that's basically what the whole point of this sort of mini tutorial is about. But now the last thing I did, which is so crucial and so important that I want to show you. So here we are, let me recap real quick. So this is zero fill. This is a large umbrella point behind, you know, behind, um, so if I'm here, it's basically in front of me. And I did video this, but every time I, I tried the live stream before and when I played the video, everything went crazy, so I'm not gonna play it. Okay, so this second image basically has the um, umbrella right at my face set to a low power. So you can see no fill, umbrella fill. Now the next one, this is the umbrella fill plus a bare flash pointed at the ceiling. And now the last thing I did is I added a V flat and I have those uh, V flat world V flats, which are cool because you can fold it in half. So what I did is I folded it in half, sort of like a table and I put it right in front of me underneath, right outside of the camera frame. And now this is a different kind of fill because now I'm not using a fill flash. I'm just using a white V flat to bounce the light back from uh, underneath me up into my chin area and take a look at the difference there. So this image, this fourth image shows you what it looks like when I have the V flat underneath me. So now check out the difference here. I mean, it's super, super stark how different the results are that you can create by adding fill. So now I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit. I want you to see, and you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you zero fill plus the most fill. Now, again, all of this is, is subject to what you're doing, what you want to accomplish. Like there's no rule that says like, okay, well, image A is better than image B, it's better for different circumstances. But if you check out this, this, this image here, which is with two fill lights and a V flat bouncing the light back up into under my chin and under my nose, it's really quite a different look. Um, and this is the point of using a fill, this is the point of fill flash or using reflective items as fill you can really get different kinds of looks. Now, 
Let me show you all these images one more time. That's no fill. That's a large umbrella fill. That's a large umbrella added a bare flash at the ceiling. And that's all of that plus a um, V flat, white V flat bouncing the light from right underneath the camera frame back up into me. Now, this is super subjective because it really depends on what you're photographing. It depends on your subject, as I said. Now, in these images, I think probably I like maybe the first one or the second one the best because I like the drama. But not all the time are you going to want that much drama, so keep that in mind. The amount, And you should, as a studio photographer, be able to dial in how much or how little drama you really want, and that's the point of this. Now, let me get back to sort of my own learning process because I think some of you will benefit from understanding sort of where I came from. So I want to show you this image, which I took quite a while back of my three buddies and bandmates. Now, this image was when I really just started learning how to shoot groups in the studio. And as I mentioned already, I, I started uh, learning from Felix Kunz's um, tutorials, his lighting guide, which really is awesome. But this is kind of a cool image, but the problem with it, what I didn't understand at the time that I took this image was that, you know, I didn't understand how to control the fill in order to tone down those shadows. So what happened was I, I ended up with an image that was kind of cool, but as I look at this now, as someone who's got a little bit more experience as a photographer, it's too dark, it's too dramatic. And I have a funny story about this image because it actually got a lot of positive feedback when I posted it on my socials, except for one of my friends, uh, one of my former bass teachers, who was a mentor of mine, and he sent me a message and he's like, that is the worst image you've ever taken. <laughs> Something like that. He really hated it. And I just, I laughed. I said, all right, thank you. I'm glad for the, for the honest feedback. But he said something even worse than that. It was like, it looks like diarrhea, I think was <laughs> his exact words. And um, so now I wouldn't go that bad on it. I don't think it's that bad, but it is pretty, it is a little diarrhea-ish in the shadows. Now, Maybe a few months later after I took this image, I had um, a guy contact me and he wanted to do some portraits of his trio. And so I had learned my lesson though from this test shoot because I knew that I didn't want it to be so dramatic because it just was too much. So what I did was in this next shoot, and I'm gonna show you the shot in a second, but I wanna to talk to you about how I lit it first, is I did very similar to this shoot. I had a very large key light, so like a huge umbrella, sort of feathered very much on the left-hand side. And then I had uh, a fill light, which was another large octobox pointed directly at the subjects. But really, the thing that made the difference was I added a third fill light, and again, like I did with this little mini tutorial today, is I added a large umbrella. No, I'm sorry, th that was the second thing. The third light I added was a bare flash, which I just put very high in a stand, pointed at my ceiling, and it just had the little reflector on it that comes with the flash, and bounced that into it. And I want you to see the difference. Now, obviously, these are two different groups of people, but I feel like this kind of shows the difference in how important the fill light is. So here, I did not have enough fill on the left. And in this image on the right, you could see that because I added a second fill light and really tamped down on those shadows, I was able to get a much more even and pleasing look to the image. So this, my friends, is the important of using and understanding fill light. Because if you have no fill, you're gonna get what I have on the left, which one of my friends described as diarrhea. And if you have enough fill and you understand how to use it, you're gonna get a much more pleasing image. Now I'll show you one more image from this particular set. Uh, let me get rid of the other one. And basically this was not like, so this, I've gotten a lot of um, compliments on this particular photo and on the other one from this series. And I gotta tell you that it wasn't crazy difficult to create this image. I just had one key light 
which was a large modifier and it was heavily feathered. So it was kind of like on the side of the subjects pointed this way. And then I had a fill umbrella, um, sorry, um, octobox pointed right at them. And then just a flash high pointed at the ceiling kind of in front of them bouncing back. So it wasn't that difficult to get, but look at the difference when you have enough fill light and you don't have enough fill light. It's really a massive difference. The other thing that having enough fill light allows you to do is color grade. So I know a lot of people ask me about like color grading and all that. And one of the things you need to do when you color grade, and this, if any of you who are video shooters who know, you know, I'm not like a great video guy. I don't consider myself like the best video guy, but I understand that when you shoot in like a C log or an F log, you're, you can, you could see how the image is really flat and not contrasty. That's because when you color grade in post, when you add a LUT, you're bringing back the depth of it. So it's very important to make sure that while you're taking the image, when you're doing stills or whether you're doing, um, you know, video, if you're going to do that, you want to leave the room to do it. So that's basically, that's the idea of this video. Let me show you a couple more images. I want to talk to you again, just a little bit about like more fill, less fill and all that. So here's an image that I did um, a couple of years ago, probably already. And this is one of my former base students, Peter. And I got a lot of compliments on this image too. And this is an image where I intentionally wanted it to be very dramatic. So this is an image that has zero fill. So basically when I lit this image, I just had a couple of continuous panels on his subject left side, camera left. And you can see that really it goes super dramatic into the shadows. So there's nothing wrong with doing this. I think that for certain images and for certain people based on their bone structure and their looks and sometimes on their age, throwing in a ton of drama is awesome. It's gonna look good. But that's basically no fill. Um, and now let me show you, I just wanna show you a couple of examples of where I got a little bit more fill or a little bit less fill. Now, here's an image I did a while back for a um, actor friend, Regina. She's an awesome actor and she's a very cool person and she wanted something dramatic. So here I have one key light, again, camera left, and this was just one bare flex panel, but you can see that it's still pretty dramatic in the shadow area, right? We got lots of drama, lots of shadow, but it's not completely black. You can still see the skin tones. And so what I did for this image is I just added a V flat on the white side on the camera right. So the flex panel hit her this way and then the light from the V flat bounced back and filled in the shadow side ever so slightly so it wasn't quite as dramatic. So really filled in those skin tones a little bit and made it a much more pleasing image. So here is an image that has a, not a fill light, but a V flat. And you don't need like a fancy V flat. All you need is a white piece of uh, poster board. And you just angle that on the other side of the person. If you have a light on one side and you're going to get the light to bounce back off that and add a fill. So that's a different kind of fill. And I'm going to show you one more image and then I'll, I'm going to rant about Canon. Here's one that I didn't take this. Obviously it's me, my friend, John Kiefer, who's an awesome photographer took it, but we were working on lighting together. And this is a lighting setup. That's a lot more complicated than anything I've showed you today that I learned from my portrait mentor, Ivan Weiss. Go check out Ivan London. Check out his work. He does uh, mentorships. I highly recommend you mentor with him if you want to learn so much about light. Anyway, so here you could see that I have a key light, which was a hard key, and then I have um, a couple of different sorts of fill. Now, without getting into the details of it, the point is, is that even on the shadow area, you can still see skin tone. So it's a subtle fill. It's not it's not too stark. It's not going from, uh, let me show you that other image again. Like here you see how it goes basically black, right? It goes black. You can barely see his skin tones once it's on the shadow side. But a much more subtle way of using fill is that you have still all of the skin tones. You can still see everything, all the detail. 
you can see all the little beard hairs and whatever, but it's still got shadow. So this subtle fill is what I want to admonish you, my watchers, and those of you who look at me as some kind of, um, you know, educator when it comes to portrait photography. I want to ad admonish you if you're learning how to do use studio lighting to really start to look at the fill, get the key where you want it, and then look at where your fill is because you're not always going to want it to go super, super black. You want skin tones. And the reason why this looks, uh, I feel like this is a, as a more, I don't know, pleasing or better look is because think about the way you look at people, right? Your eyes are, um, uh, not just people, but the way your eyes work, I should say. Your eyes have an incredible amount of dynamic range with the, the camera pales in comparison to the amount of dynamic range, meaning the amount that your eye can see from darks to lights is truly incredible. So once you get inside of a studio and you start playing with lights, the, the camera can't see these things anywhere nearly as well as the human eye can. So we, as the photographers in the studio, it's our job and our responsibility to learn how to use key lights and fill lights and fill sources to make a much more pleasing and subtle and human result. So that's kind of the point of this tutorial. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, that's basically for the tutorial part of my ranting today. Um, let me know what you think about this. If you feel like this is helpful to you, if you feel like this has been good content, let me know. I'd like to hear from you. I always like hearing from, from you all, but now I'm just going to rant for a minute because now, obviously I'm not saying anything that you probably don't know if you're already like keeping up with what's going on in the photography world. But basically, um, Canon has basically threatened to sue some other lens companies that were making third-party lenses for the RF mount. And people are not happy. And I'm not happy either. And I, I think that there really is a, a lot of fairness to people not being happy. So let me explain. So basically, I upgraded. Um, and when I, when I upgraded to, to my camera, which I use now, my studio Canon R5, about, I don't know, less than a year ago, the other camera I was looking at was uh, the Fuji uh, medium format and also the Fuji, you know, crop sensor cameras too. And I wound up anyway buying an X-T4 because I love Fuji cameras and, and that's just I love them and that's what I did. And um, that's actually what I used today to take these, these sample images. Anyway, I wound up getting an R5 and I got the adapter and I've been using my RF, I'm um, sorry, my EF lenses. Um, but I've done some videos where I kind of rant and complain about the fact that like, I will not buy RF lenses because they're so cost prohibitive. prohibitive. Now, I'm a professional photographer, so I do make a living with a camera. And even for me, like I just, find after spending the amount of money I spent on the R5 body and the grip because the battery life isn't so great and the adapter, like I just don't want to buy any lenses. So I've been using my EF lenses. And I will say that the EF lenses really do work great on the camera. Um, so on one level, I, I don't feel a, a pressing need to upgrade. So that's the other reason why I haven't bought any RF lenses. Uh, like a month or so ago, I picked up a, a nifty 50 RF and, um, let's just say even for a nifty 50 that, you know, it's not going to be a great, the greatest of lenses, it leaves a lot to be desired. And so I was kind of disappointed in that. I feel like they really phoned it in, in a lot of ways. And so fast forward to like maybe a week ago, I heard how Canon, and if you didn't hear Canon basically sent like a cease and desist, I believe, to one of the third-party lens manufacturers who had to pull all of their lenses. I think it was Viltrox, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyway, Canon basically is like throwing down their weight against third-party manufacturers, and it looks like they don't want anyone to make RF lenses. Um, 
Now this might be temporary and it might be just this one company. We're not really sure yet, but the optics of this and pardon that pun, the optics of them doing this is really bad. Uh, even for someone like me, who's been like a lifelong cannon shooter. And I'll tell you why. Well, because I spent a buttload of money on this camera and the camera is amazing. And the reason why I bought an R5 is because I felt like, well, let me go with the higher end camera because I will use it for like, I literally will use it for a decade. And like I did with my 5D Mark III, like I'm, I'm not gonna upgrade every two years. So I figured, let me get a better one. I kind of looked at it the way I looked at buying my Mac. Like I bought like the fully loaded MacBook Pro because I was like, I want to be able to use this for like a decade. Now, whether I'm that smart or not is up, up to individuals to decide, but that was my reasoning. Um, but now I feel like not only are the lenses are ridiculously priced. So I was looking at like the 50 millimeter, you know, the 1.2 or an 85, one, two or one, four. And I'm just like, man, I got to spend like another three grand just to get a good lens. Like this is out of control. So needless to say, I probably wouldn't have even bought like a third party lens for the camera, but just the fact that they're you know, crushing those dreams of people who want to buy or the option to buy a third party lens. I feel like it's really bad optics for the company. And I feel like it shows sort of like they don't seem to care about the little guys like us, the littler users who want to use their products, but maybe don't have three grand. They want to just throw out onto a lens. And, um, so it's kind of, May, really miffing me a little bit, making me a little upset. So I will add to that, that, you know, when I was a young man, kind of up and coming in, in the, uh, in the, in the two th early two thousands, when I worked in the industry, Canon was still kind of the underdog at that point. And, and Nikon was like the behemoth to be beaten. Um, and I loved Canon because Canon was always sort of like the scrappy underdog that really I felt like they really were pushing the bounds of innovation and they really were kind of doing these things just to prove themselves. Um, and Nikon was kind of like, not that Nikon wasn't great back then as they, I still think Nikon's great, but they were, they were more the status quo or like they just were established. And you know, now I feel like Canon is kind of like the big behemoth in the room and like they sort of, I don't know, I feel like they just don't care about some of their users like they should anymore. So that's my rant about the Canon stuff. I know a lot of you, if you're following what's been happening, and I'll recap real quick, that Canon is basically, basically it looks like Canon is not gonna allow anybody, uh, any third party companies to make RF lenses. Now, whether or not this is temporary, who knows, maybe, and it might just be this one company that they just were annoyed that they just, you know, um, made these lenses without permission. That's very, very, could be very, very true. So maybe we're overreacting. I think time will tell. But I think it's very important for Canon to, to tread lightly here and decide how they want to move forward because a lot of people are being turned off now to Canon products because of this. And I got to tell you that I... I borrowed a Fuji X-H2S recently, um, and I did a video on the autofocus, which you could see on my channel, and I'm gonna do another video, which is like an initial impressions. And I really feel like for the work that I do, which is these talking head kind of videos, it's nothing complicated, and also basic video stuff like BTS video and, and, and interviews, nothing, nothing that I need crazy autofocus for, and also studio portraiture and portraiture out and about, that the focus in the new Fuji X-H2S was awesome. And, and honestly, it felt very much like using an R5 to me. I don't think the focus is quite as good, but I, I mean, I set it to 15 frames per second, mechanical shutter. I was firing off shots of my kids, and family members. I fired off a bunch of shots in the studio with a test subject, and the camera was awesome. And I really had no issues with it. So I think, you know, Canon really needs to figure out what they're doing here because now I have thoughts in my head like, well, I could, I could sell my R5 with a grip 
and the adapter and buy, uh, you know, an XH2S plus, you know, a, um, plus a, um, you know, a great lens. Now, all right, hang in there because I just see, hey, Mac, what's up? How you doing? Yeah, okay, so Mac just, con I don't know, I, I apologize if I didn't see this sooner, but Mac commented, Peter, you don't lose money buying L glass. Yeah, I, I get that, Mac. I definitely get that. I know that, like, you buy those lenses and, and you have them a long time. I think it's more the principle of it. Um, I think it's just, like, just the idea of spending that much money on a lens when I spent all that money on the camera. I don't know. I just, it just, I find it very irksome to me. And again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing headshots and portraits basically every day. I mean, it's not like I'm not a hobbyist. I'm doing this for a living, but still like in today's economy, like you really, you really got to, you know, count your pennies and, 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 and like, be careful. It's crazy out there. Like I have two kids and I can't believe how much money I spend on food every month. Um, but then Mac also said, I have an R5 and a GFX 100S. Never pick up the R5. See, Mac, that's what I'm talking about. GFX 100, 45 to 100, and don't look back. Yeah, so this is the other thing I'm thinking. I'm thinking that eventually, like, I'll wind up with, you know, like the, the medium format Fuji. But that, the, the problem with that is it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily um, resolve my like I want to save money part of the equation because, you know, I'm going to be dumping a lot of money into that too. Uh, but we'll see. I don't know. I, I'm really thinking of maybe um, changing over. I'm probably not going to do anything anytime soon. I don't like to make changes and then selling stuff, as you know, is a pain in the butt. But, and I'm very, very happy with the R5. I mean, I'm thrilled with the R5, even with the EF lenses. But like I was saying before, I just feel like the, you know, the... The way Canon's going about this third-party lens stuff is, I don't know, it's just a little off-putting. And um, I'm a little disappointed in how, how it was all handled. Um, but yeah, yeah, Mac, I get it. I know like the, the I, have, I have quite a few friends who are using the medium format Fujis and everybody swears by them. And for me, like, because I'm primarily a studio photographer, right, it definitely makes sense. Like, the only thing I guess to worry about when you get a camera like that is those huge files. Like, I already, already with a 40, 45, is that megapixels in the, in the R5? I think it's 45, 40, 45, whatever it is. Like, those are some big files. I got to really move stuff off the hard drive and, and quickly. But, yeah, I don't know. That's just where I'm at. Um, there's something about Fuji too, and I've said this before, and you know, there's something about Fuji when it comes to the cameras and the colors and the user experience and the design of the cameras. They're really, I feel like, like a Fuji system and the cameras and, and everything about it is really designed for the creative. Like, it sounds stupid, but when I'm using my Fuji, my X-T4, I just feel more creative with it. And I know that's silly, but I think it's just something about kind of the design and the creativity of the design and also the film emulations and everything like that. Um, and I feel like with the Canon, it's a little bit more meat and potatoes. Not that that's an issue, a real reason to change anything, but that's like that emotional part of it that, you know, we all get into when, when we're talking about like gear. But the other thing I love about Fuji is that I feel like Fuji is, is a, since it's a smaller company, um, it just seems a lot more like an inclusive company, like a company that cares a little bit more about their clients. I could be wrong about that, but that's just the feeling I get. And I like, I love how passionate Fuji users are about their cameras. And I love how like people who use, like you, if you don't use a Fuji, if you've never had a Fuji and you don't use it, you just don't know. But those of us who have experienced it, like you know that there's something magical about the, ca magical about the cameras. And there's also something like really cool about the community. The Fuji community, we're all a little bit like crazed. Like we can be very sensitive about our Fuji gear. That's for sure. But it's a very kind of close knit community and everyone really loves the brand. So that's kind of what I like about it too. Anyway, that's, that's that. And yeah, I, I agree, Mac. It's like the shooting experience, right? It's awesome. It's really cool. Well, anyway, 
Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. And I hope that this little mini tutorial and my little rant after was enjoyable to you. Um, I will probably do another video at some point about Beauty Dish where I go into it a little deeper and also about Fill Flash. But the thing I want you all watching this to get out of it is the main thing I want you to get out of it is that the thing you need to pay most attention to once you get your key light figured out is your fill. I think the fill on many levels is more important than the key. The amount of fill, where you place the fill, how you nuance the fill. So for those of you who are a little bit newer to studio photography, that's what I would recommend you do. And again, if you have any questions or comments, leave me a comment. I love hearing from you. Uh, go ahead and subscribe if you like my videos. Again, I, I don't really know where this channel is going direction-wise right now. I know that some of you like me talking about gear, some of you like me talking about studio photography, whatever, business. So I'm gonna keep doing whatever kind of feels right to me and we'll see where it, where it ends up. But I really do appreciate all of you jo who join me and all of you who watch my videos and subscribe. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. I love doing this and I am looking forward to, you know, hearing from you all more. And Mac, yep, firmware updates. Good, Mac, I'm excited about that too. So I will leave it off here. Uh, and here's wishing you all a great night. And I wish you some awesome pictures this week. Go out and take some cool pictures. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye for now. And I'm logging off.